And who is he that can hurt you if you be zealous of good? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, on this Father's Day, I thought that this quote from the epistle really points out well to one of the chief duties of a father. That is, the chief duty to protect the family from harm. It's, it's kind of a natural instinct of, of any parent, but most especially of a father, that, that, they, that they stand in the way and intercede to protect their children and their spouse from, from all harmful aggressors that come their way. But it's not, it's an, a duty which isn't just specific to fathers of a family, but it's a duty that's specific and can be seen in any head of any type of society. Because after all, a, a family is a small society, and thus it has a head, just as any type of parish is a, is a small society, and it has its priest as its, as its head, or any ship is a small society, and it has its captain as its head, or any state or country is a society that has its leader, as its head. And it goes on from there. Well, it's important to note that what in seeing what St. Peter says in that, he's not guaranteeing a freedom from physical harm to those who look after the and be zealous for the good. But when he speaks of that no one can hurt you if you're zealous for the good, He's rather speaking of a freedom from the ultimate harm, the spiritual harm. And this can be seen by the very next sentence that is there, where he says that, but if you also suffer anything for justice's sake, blessed are ye. Because he recognizes that at times we will suffer physical dangers, physical difficulties, trials and tribulations, but when we are searching after the good, the ultimate good, which is God, no spiritual harm shall ever come our way so long as that is our goal, that is our focus. And it's this which is the chiefest of duties of a father. He has to protect himself and his whole family as the guardian, as the head, not only from physical assaults, but most especially from spiritual assaults, from spiritual dangers and harm that may come that way. I'll illustrate this for you all now uh, with an example from my recent trip to to Europe. I know that several of you have asked me to to talk about that again, and uh, and so I'll do so. And but I won't tell you about one of the most, you know, some of the more known places that I went to, but I'll rather I'll tell you about a beautiful shrine with a beautiful history that's a bit off of the beaten path that Father Trauner uh, and myself went to see, and that is the shrine of Maria Cell. Maria Cell is a basilica, it's actually a town itself, uh, in the Alps, in central Austria, and there's a basilica there with the, under the same name, and uh, and a very beautiful and miraculous statue is in, of Our Lady is enshrined there. And the history of the shrine is that that territory in the, in, up in the mountains in the Alps there was given to the monks of Saint Lambrecht in around the year 1103. Well, now this barren wilderness, this barren territory had to be cultivated for the monastery. And so, in 1157, a monk named Magnus was sent from the, the, the base convent uh, as a, to the area as a minister, as a way to kind of get things going, get things set up there, so that they can establish a, a monastery there. And as he made his way to the property, as he came there, there was a large rock that had blocked his pathway, and it was really the only clear way to that spot. And that he could get to easily. And so this large boulder had fallen down from from higher above, and it blocked the way. And so now Magnus was looking at it and saying, well, you know, this is no good. This is going to make things much more difficult. So what did he do? He had recourse to prayer, and he had with him this small wooden Marian statue, which he placed upon the rock, 
And then he began to pray to Our Lady. Well, wouldn't you have it, with his prayers right before him, under the feet of Our Lady's statue, the rock was rent in two, and both pieces fell away and cleared the way for Magnus to continue on. And so in seeing that and in doing that, he decided, well, this, is, this miracle was such a great miracle. On this spot, I'll build myself a nice little cell, a little building there, a wooden building that I can live in and I can also have set up as, my, as the first chapel uh, to, to, for this area. And so he did. He built himself this small chapel building where he also lived. Around the year 1200, so about a little less than 50 years later, the, uh, you know, the devotion and that miracle had begun to, at this point, spread throughout uh, the kingdom uh, the, and had been made known uh, to various people what had happened. And so people started to pray to Our Lady of Maria Cell. And one of the people, that, or two of the people, I should say, that had prayed specifically was Henry Margrave of Moravia and his wife. Henry was the Duke of Bohemia, and which is, you know, today really, you know, a good chunk of Czech, the Czech Republic. And he, um, he prayed because he and his wife had, been, had fallen under uh, a severe case of gout, and they could not alleviate the severe pain that they had. So they prayed to Our Lady of Maria Zell, and by her intercession, they were healed from their gout. And in Thanksgiving, they decided that they were going to make a pilgrimage out into the wilderness to this very spot of the shrine. And so they off they went. Uh, they traveled all through the mountains to finally arrive at Maria Zell and seeing the small little chapel where Our Lady's statue, you know, that small little statue was enshrined there. They decided, well, it's not just enough to pilgrimage there, but we're so thankful. Let's build a church. And so they built a small stone church, better than the wooden one that was there, and a more fitting home for Our Lady. And because of this, now the, the devotion continued to grow until when in the mid-1300s, the Hungarian king Ludwig I prayed to Our Lady of Maria Zell before a very great battle. He had to fight against the Turks, the Muslims, that were trying to invade. And they had a much, the Turks had a much larger army than his own. And so he prayed to Our Lady of Maria Zell, and they were victorious in battle. And so he too, in Thanksgiving, made a pilgrimage out to, to the middle of the, the mountains to Maria Zell, and there built the Gothic church, which... Uh, you know, stands today. It had been damaged several times over the years and had to be rebuilt and, and changed around a bit, but the general structure of it is that which was built by the Hungarian King Ludwig I. So now, that history is there, that beautiful devotion. When you walk into the church, there is, is the same statue of Our Lady, that miraculous statue set up in this beautiful uh uh, completely adorned with silver altarpiece that lays in the center of the church, about halfway up from the back to the main altar in the in the in the, the head of the church is this large altar that is part way. It stands right on the spot where that first original cell was, where that first miracle happened, <clears throat> and it's a very beautiful shrine. Yet when we went there, Father Trauner and I couldn't help but be astonished by some of the strange happenings that happened as we arrived. Some place that was such a sight of piety and holiness, in a way, was quite different today. Yes, it's still a place of pilgrimage. Yes, many uh, Catholics still visit there. Yet, when we were walking through the streets, there was three young boys that began to laugh and mock at us. They were Muslim children. And they were just sitting there on the street and had nothing better to do in their day than to mock Catholic priests walking towards the shrine. Well, we continued inside and we prayed at the, at the shrine of Our Lady, which still is extremely beautiful. And then we started making our way around the rest of the church. And we were looking at one of the beautiful side altars. And what is put there but a large picture um, of Bartholomew, the, the Russian Orthodox patriarch, enshrined on one of the side altars of a Catholic church there, put there specifically 
by the bishop for the sake of the quote-unquote ecumenism that happens. And so in the midst of this glorious devotion is this kind of disgusting modernism type of approach to everything. And it's easy to point it out, but what's the connection to what we're talking about today? What's the connection to the duties of a father? Well, let's see exactly that. This is what made me think of it, is that we'll first look at, we'll look at each of those instances separately. First off, we'll look at the allowance of the so-called Muslim refugees into Austria and see that this is a failure of the head of state of the country of Austria to protect its people from external dangers. You're talking about a country that was for hundreds of years the center of Christendom as the seat of the Holy Roman Empire. You're talking about one of the most Catholic countries in the world, allowing in today over 100,000 Muslim immigrants under the title of, quote, refugees from the Middle East. Austria, which has only about 8 million people, allowing in such a huge number of, of these people who are so different they have a different religion that is radically opposed to Christianity. They have a different language. They have a different culture altogether. And they have no interest in conforming whatsoever. They are non-productive members of society, largely. And they commit various crimes as such, threaten terrorism, and continue to live off of the dole, as it were, continue to live off of government money, all of this for the sake of a so-called social enabling. Yet these people have no desire to be part of their society. Point, in case in point, these children, it was a Monday, yet in the middle of the afternoon, they are not in any kind of school whatsoever. They are not speaking German. They are, have nothing better to do but to mock Catholics at a Catholic shrine pointing out that quote-unquote danger from without. And for this, it's much like a father in a family who doesn't protect his family from external moral threats. He doesn't take care to monitor the movies or the television or the video games that they see, to monitor and protect them against the dangers that are out there on the Internet to look after to see who their friends are and to, to check up to make sure that they're not providing a bad influence on their children, to making sure that, that they are being educated in a good and Catholic way, even if that means that sacrifice of time and effort to really produce a Catholic education for the children and to create an environment that from the externals is a safe haven at their home. That when our children go forth into the world as they must, that instead of being numb to the distractions and to the vices and to the, and to the, the, the temptations of the world, rather they have a knee-jerk reaction of a total disgust, of total shock that what is out there in the world, and it appalls them. That is what a goal of a father should be. He should protect them as much as he can from the dangers of the outside and realize that this threat is a far greater threat and a far more imminent threat than any kind of robber or evildoer who might threaten physical harm to the family. And so it is a serious duty upon the shoulders of a father to undertake that protection of the children from spiritual threats from without. And despite the amount of effort that it takes, it's not, it, no effort is greater enough than, and no cause more worthy than the protection of the spiritual welfare of our children. Next, we see also that example of the enshrining of the Patriarch of Moscow, the Orthodox Patriarch, inside the Basilica, providing 
Not a danger from without, but a danger from within. A scandal from within. You know, the, the, the so-called bishop there is entrusted with the souls of the people who attend there. And to be the one to put a picture like that is a scandal given to all those faithful who go there. Now, of course, we know that the bishop of the diocese there is far from a Catholic, and this is, you know, in line with his way of thinking, but that's the very problem itself. He has no embracing of that protection of the danger from within the society itself. Rather, he scandalizes the people by his actions. It's much like a father who has created himself as an enemy to those in his care. Because this is even worse than allowing the enemies from the outside to come and influence the family. It is now the father himself who has become the enemy within. He doesn't pray with the family. He acts in a way that's scandalous and providing bad example with little care as to what his influence is in. Little care as to what kind of effects his foul language may have, or his injustice, or his uh, lack of charity, or any kind of giving in to the passions regularly without much care to who sees it and what the effects are. Not making sure that not only that is he praying, but he is leading the family in the spiritual life, leading from those that very front line in the spiritual battle. This is how we can cause uh, a danger from within. Now, you men here who are fathers or who may be fathers in the future, you're all called to that higher calling of being good fathers. And I know you here are trying to do what you can to do that. And I'm not here saying that, that you, know, you are enemies of your family necessarily. But we do have to reflect because we all know that each and every one of us is far from perfect. Each and every one of us can grow and can, and can improve upon ourselves and to perfect ourselves more and more. We have to do this until the day we die. We can never be satisfied where we sit right now, where we are spiritually, where we are in the influence of our families, where we are in our duties as fathers. Yet we have to always be looking to do more, to be more perfect in that vocation. It goes so far beyond any kind of material providing. Of course, this is an absolute necessity. Of course, this is something that is part in, integral to the duties of a father. Yet the spiritual providing is the most important thing because no matter what our children become in their lives, no matter what vocation they take, no matter what type of job they may have, whether they're successful or not in the world, there's no greater thing than to have them save their souls. There is no greater cause to work for than the salvation of those entrusted to us. And yes, this comes with hardship. Yes, this comes with work and determination and a persistence in each and every one of your vocations. You're called to do many things, many things that at times are difficult. You're called to be an example of manliness to your children, especially your sons, but to all your your, your children, what it really means to be a man. It goes so far beyond having a, a growly voice and, a, and, and kind of like that grunting approach of, to life and, you know, embracing, you know, cutting wood or, you know, building fires or whatever it may be. It goes so far beyond any of those things. But a true manliness of character, bearing wrongs patiently and well, being slow to speak out against others, bearing our hardships with with patience and offering them up in the divine providence of God, being dutiful in spite of our own tiredness to our spiritual duties. That example is seen by all our children and has more of an effect than any words 
about manly virtue than we could ever offer. You're all called to protect your children from moral dangers and spiritual dangers all about in their lives. A duty which sometimes can be very trying because you just want to relax a bit, and yet you have to talk to your children. You have to instruct them. You have to be on the watch and to be therefore careful in all those things, both as we talked of the external influences in their lives and your own personal actions, the internal influences. You're called to be the models of virtue and spirituality in your lives. Think of that, that that duty there. You're not just called to sometimes pray, but you should be the driving force from the very front of the pack to show the way of how to live a virtuous life and a spiritual life, to lead <coughs> by example always, to be the one to call the family to the daily rosary, to lead that rosary yourselves, to be the one to ensure that... The morning prayers are said and the evening prayers are said, whether we are physically there or we just make sure in inquiring that it's part of that daily schedule. To be the one to say, you know what, it's a Saturday, but we have the time. Why don't we come to Mass? Why don't we do a little extra? Why don't we undertake some sort of novena or different devotion for different times of the liturgical year? You're called to be the ones to not only to show that, but to foster and to build upon the spiritual life in the family, to do and lead meditation and to give little spiritual stories of saints. Whatever you can do to build up that spiritual life, that's all part of your duty. That's all leading from the front. That's all having an influence that is not demanding, but commanding. To demand anybody can do, anybody can say, Say your prayers. But to command means that it's not only good for you, but it's good for me too. And the respect is command, that is commanded is a respect and an honor that is followed by all those in your care. Now, we all make mistakes. We don't necessarily, you know, hit it out of the park every time. But it's that constant working at it, that constant striving that each and every one of us has to embrace. That constant striving that even if our children now fall outside of the sphere of our influence because they've grown and they've become adults, well, the greatest good we can do is still on our knees by our prayers. That recognition that we are never satisfied where we are now, but always, as the epistle says, searching after the good the ultimate good, which is God himself. And if that's our goal, despite our own human weakness, despite our own failures from time to time, we will always be increasing in our own spiritual life. We will always be increasing in our good influence upon our children. We will be looking out for their spiritual good our whole lives long, doing whatever we can to not only ourselves grow to the ultimate good, which is God, but to bring those under us along with us. And it's by that as our chief duty, as our recognition, that we will have our greatest success as fathers in fulfilling our duty. It is a tireless vocation. It is a vocation that requires great sacrifice and great effort. But those great efforts come with great rewards, provided that we continually always strive to fulfill them and always work to the salvation of those around us. And with that, we will imitate the saints. We will imitate the good Saint Joseph, who was the foster father of Christ, and imitate God himself in our very lives of always looking to the salvation of those entrusted to us. May God bless you. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.